Welcome to Frequency Clear. I am your host, Bart Black. There's an old Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And the fact of the matter is, is we do live in interesting times. We live in some of the most dynamic times in human history. And it's really for some very fundamental and simple reasons, is that with the law of accelerating returns, as technology speeds up, communications speed up, and that causes human society and events within it to speed up. So now we experience many magnitudes of orders of change much greater at a much faster pace than ever before in human history. And that kind of brings me to the, to the point of what I really wanted to talk about today in relation to that, again, which is this idea that civilization becomes more susceptible to disruption the more complex it becomes. A hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, if there was a catastrophic event, if there was a depression, economic depression, pandemic, the ability of civilization to hold itself together and to rebound from such events was much greater because instead of populations being packed into centralized cities on top of each other, you had a majority uh, of the population was in the countryside. Now those numbers have completely flipped where, you know, it's something like 80, 90 percent of the population lives in, in megacities now and are totally disconnected from their own survival. They don't have the capability like we did 100, 200 years ago being an, aggregate, an agrarian civilization and society that people fundamentally understood how to grow their own food, live off the land, things like this. And so because of that, our civilization is much more prone to disruption than it ever has been before. And I think this is something that we can all see around us as the story of history increases, is this unsteadiness to civilization. And this is really fascinating because you can look at it in any, in any way from an economic standpoint. The world economy is on the largest financial bubble in, in the history of the world. From a food production standpoint, while we are producing more food than has ever been produced before, feeding more humans than have ever been fed in the sum total of, of history, that system is fundamentally flawed um, and is heading towards a breakdown point. And there have been numerous studies about this going all the way back to the 1970s in the Club, the Club of Rome that dealt with population um, increase versus resource management within world civilization. And the, the idea, you know, in those studies was shown that by 2030, civilization would collapse because it couldn't manage the resources uh, in the face of such large population gains. Nature. We, you know, the fact is, is that we're fundamentally polluting the earth. Um, we're acidifying the oceans. We're dumping plastics into the oceans. And what's sad is, is the first world nations of the West have done the most to limit this and pass laws to protect the environment. But unfortunately, the, the countries of the East, India, Indochina, I mean, Indonesia, India, China, um, parts of Africa, uh, just keep continuing to increase their pollutants into the world. And the, the, the factions of the West that are aware of these pollution of the pollution problem continually have been hijacked by political movements mostly on the left in the Western world that uh, just try to use them to achieve more power within the, the Western economies while completely ignoring um, the nightmare of continued escalation of pollution from these other countries because there's no political value in, in, uh, in challenging China or India um, to their pollution of the, the earth. Like those societies and those civilizations just simply won't respond. Um, and so then you're in a feedback loop where the, the West keeps 
trying to solve these problems by attacking itself when it has been the most progressive in dealing with that problem. But because, again, it doesn't lead to a political solution, the powers that be that control those institutions continually use them as a way of creating corporate hierarchies and bureaucracies um, and taxation systems for the people of the West. And the people of the West want to achieve that so they can they continue to capitulate and give up more power and money to those institutions, but those institutions aren't actually solving the problem. So, you know, that's just a microcosm of you can look at all of these different vectors in society and understand that stability is increasingly um, becoming non-existent. Um, if you look at what's happening with the coronavirus worldwide right now, and the, the explosion of this virus in China, and you see that the reality is is the, the world system is simply one event away from total collapse. Um, now, systemically, we're already heading towards, towards collapse. And again, the parallels, you know, how we manage our resources, our economies, um, are all heading toward, es escalating uh, towards a, a brick wall where, you know, fundamentally things will have to change. Um, and of course, you know, the sooner we adopt understanding that things have to change, the, the better off we'll, we'll be. Um, and there are elements of the society that understand this. You know, the trend from the elite, the wealthy, inside the West, is to move out of the cities, become homesteaders, go off-grid, start taking care of themselves. There's an entire acceleration to, to that. Um, one of the articles I have in front of me that you can look at, that you can look up online, is out of The New Yorker, and it's titled Doomsday Prep for the Super Rich. This was written two years ago. Some of the wealthiest people in America and Silicon Valley, New York, and beyond are getting ready for the crack up of civilization. Uh, this week, there's an article called Homesteaders, Catastrophists Run for the Hills to Flee U.S. Uncertainty. That's out of Reuters. And you can search those articles, and we're, we'll supply the links at the bottom of this uh, video and the bottom of this recording. And that's just two articles. I mean, there's literally dozens and dozens of articles of this trend of millionaires and billionaires checking out of society, deciding to go off grid, moving to New Zealand, uh, moving to remote locations in the United States, moving to Uruguay, uh, locations in the Bahamas. And you, you, know, you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? And the truth of the matter is, is the people that occupy that level of society are usually the ones that have access to the best information and the best research. And this research is all public. I mean, the, the mathematical models have been put out, the Homeland Security studies have been put out, NASA studies have been put out, referencing everything that I'm talking about. That the, that the highest levels of our civilization, there are is this understanding that how we're managing our resources is completely untenable and is gonna to lead to a, a possible catastrophe. And that the reality is we are one, what's called black swan event. A black swan event is, um, you know, when the English went to Australia, they discovered that there were black swans. And up until that, that time in zoology, and exploration, there had been no black swans ever discovered. And so it was just thought that they didn't exist. Well, a black swan event is something that is completely unexpected that then occurs that changes everything. And when you, again, going back to looking at this coronavirus that's, that's occurring right now, it doesn't matter if it's the coronavirus, it doesn't matter if it's a pandemic, an economic crash. The truth of the matter is, is our civilization is held together our economic system is completely held together right now by faith. And if there's ever anything that can challenge that faith on a fundamental level, it will result in a reaction that could cripple civilization to the point that it couldn't reboot itself. You know, the amount of specialization that it's taken for us to get to the level of resource management that, we're, that we are currently um, benefiting from require generations and generations to build on top of one another. The reality is, is we don't know how to fix our phones. 
Most people don't know how to fix their, their cars. Uh, most people don't know how to get their own food, get their own water, if these things become unavailable from their grocery stores or from their municipality. So the further and further we've become removed from our ability to take care of ourselves, from our ability to uh, take care of our families, our communities, the more danger we've created for all of us. And that's fundamentally what I always make the point is the, the question of our time. If we as individuals want to survive, the answer is not running for the hills. The answer is not developing some ranch out in the middle of nowhere or on some island where your family's taken care of and that's it. That answer leads to a dead end, it leads to nowhere. The only answer that we can give that will create a more positive potential future for humanity, a human future, a future that we all want to live in, where we can be safe and happy and secure, and our children can be safe and happy and secure, is through by the commitment to community. It's by the commitment of creating self-sustaining communities at the community level, at the city level, and then you build networks out from there, that those networks could then become networks for states and entire nations. But it has to start at the very bottom of civilization. Where it all starts is, is with communities coming together. That's where the begin of the change has to occur. It's when communities have the ability to feed themselves, provide their own water, their own electricity. That's the answer. That is how you survive coronavirus. That is how you create a future that no matter what happens, we can be free and happy and have the ability to make our own choices for our future. Because that is the reality of what we're dealing with right now. We are sleepwalking into a situation where our whole world could change in an instant. You know, I've, I've met friends over the years that had survived the Bosnian Civil War. And it's truly fascinating because they'll tell you that the news stations and the government up until the bombs started falling were telling everyone that everything was fine and everything was going to be okay. And let that sink in. Because we all know it's played out in pop culture movies and we've seen it happen over and over again that the, the, the powerful in our society will 100% abandon the population in a crisis scenario. They'll go into their bunkers, they'll go into their bases and they will allow whatever happens to happen. You know, in this catastrophe that's happening in Wuhan province, I heard a caller call in that was an American that's over there working, talking about going to the U.S. Embassy and saying, um, I need to get out of the country. And the embassy telling him, okay, come back tomorrow and we'll have better answers for you. He came back the next day, the U.S. Embassy had been completely evacuated and they were gone. We can't afford, whether it's the best government or the worst, worst government in the world, we cannot afford to continue to bet our futures and the futures of our children and the future of our world on any outside force. It is a suicide pact. It will destroy us. The only way for us to have a future is for us to take our power back to form communities of like-minded people that are dedicated to the same principles that we believe in and then do our best. That is the only way we will make it out of this next decade. And my prediction is, is this next, next decade, we will see more change in the next 10 years than we've seen in the past 50 to 100 years. That is my prediction. As the acceleration of change continues, as things become increasingly unstable, that is what's going to happen. And that's why I created my company, Eden Grow Systems. 
years ago when I first started analyzing all of this and I saw the potential for, for breakdown, I went along the path of trying to understand what could I do to save my children and to save my family. And I designed and invented a system that is a food, the modular farming system that supplies its own water, its own power, recycles its own waste, can feed a family of four, can operate in almost any environment or temperature range. And I was very fortunate to hook up with someone else that had the exact same vision, had been working on the exact same thing, and happened to be an aerospace engineer and way smarter than me. So we were able to take everything that my team had done putting together the concept of my life pod and what my now partner, Jeff Raymond, had done constructing what he called the HAB. And he has a YouTube channel called The Real Martian, totally cataloging his journey, which I, I encourage anybody to, do, to, uh, to go and look at. But it's by the combining of, of both of those systems that we developed the ultimate modular farming system. And that's that journey is where I realized that it wasn't about the individual. That I could go out into the middle of nowhere, that I could take care of my family. But all that story ends with, if something does happen, is a Mad Max scenario where it's every man for himself, it's every family for themselves. And that will not lead to the future that any of us really want. For the future to be a free and human future requires that humans make the choice to take their power and their destiny back into their own hands. And as I always quote, there is a term in nature called delta, which is an organism will not change till the pain of change becomes less than the pain of staying the same. So listen to that again. An organism will not change until the pain of change becomes less than the pain of staying the same. Well, per my analysis, there's pain coming. And humans are the only creature on earth with the ability to conceptualize the future. So we have a choice. We can see the cliff coming. We can see the danger all around us. We can see the multiplying of events within nature and society that threaten the stability of our lives and our communities. And we can simply sit back and wait for these events to trample us under their feet, or we can proactively take charge of our lives and take power back from these systems. And we can create a better future, a cleaner future, a happier future, a future that frees people from the systems of control around them and allow them to actually make their own decisions about the kind of world that they want to live in. And wherever you are on the political spectrum, these are ideas that everyone can embrace, that all of us can get behind. A green future full of organic food supplied at the community level so that communities can make their own decisions about how they want to live, how they want their resources, of time and energy and money spent. So that's fundamentally what I'm the message that I'm trying to get out. I'm trying to make people understand where this all comes from and how it's easy to see where it's all going. That's the choice of our time. And it will determine everything about our future. And that's all I can ask, is which future do you want? <laughs>